This is the fourth and final act of our optics crash course. We're going to start out talking about magnification. And we discussed magnification briefly before when we were talking about central ray tracing. We're going to revisit it here uh, and formalize things a little bit. OK, so transverse magnification is magnification in a direction that's perpendicular to the direction of the movement of, of light. So here light is moving from the left side of the page to the right side of the page, of course. And the uh, magnification is uh, up and down uh, on the page, which is, of course, perpendicular to left to right. Um, in this case, the object is uh, three centimeters tall, and the image is six centimeters tall. Uh, magnification, uh, transverse mag, is the height of the image over the height of the optic, uh, uh, object. So this would have a transverse mag of two, no units. Um, so uh, these are, uh, we're going to see similar triangles. And the, the height of the images is proportional to the distance uh, to the images. Um, so uh, height of image uh, over height of object is equal to distance um, to image uh, from the lens. Uh, over distance to uh, object. Um, so it, we, in, in order to uh, demonstrate this, we draw two central rays. One central ray going from the base of the candle, the other one from the tip of the candle. You've already seen this with the previous central ray um, illustration. And we see that we have two similar triangles here. Uh, and uh, the ratios of the heights are equal to the ratios of the bases, or the hypotenai, but I don't expect you to be calculating those. And this is the case for um, an object that's at 20 centimeters, 0.2 meters, um, that uh, hits a lens, minus 5 diopter lens, uh, produces um, a rays of light coming out of lens of minus 10 diopters. We extrapolate that backwards. We get an image at 10 centimeters. Everything I just said was virgins. We're not worried about virgins now. We are big boys and girls and going on to central ray tracing. Uh, so here, uh, once more, we draw the uh, ray of light from the candle through the center of the lens and from the base of the candle through the center of the lens. And uh, the line that passes through the top of the candle carries information about the top of the candle and the base of the candle about the base of the candle. And we can therefore see uh, that the image is formed uh, and uh, and is minified be, because the base uh, is only uh, 10 centimeters to the excuse me the distance from the lens to the image is only 10 centimeters base of the triangle, um, whereas the distance to the object is 20 centimeters. This would be a magnification of 0.5, not a negative mag, a mag of 0.5. Okay, um, in this case in which the object is the smaller candle and the image is the larger candle further to the left. We now have a plus five lens. Uh, we uh, do central ray tracing again from the object through the center of the lens. Only now it's not encountering the image because the image is behind it. What do we do? We extrapolate it backwards. And then we once more have our triangles and we can see that the magnification in this system is two times uh, because the distance to the image is twice the distance to the object. Now, um, there are a few numbers in optics that you need to memorize. The index of refraction of water being 1.33, uh, of air 1.0. Here's another number, except that this one is uh, fairly mythical, uh, which is the distance from the nodal point of the eye to the retina is 17 millimeters, always and forever for the boards. In real life, I, uh, occasionally, maybe never. Um, people who are axial myopes, obviously, um, obviously this number is going to be longer and hyperopes it's going to be shorter. Uh, but if the purposes of the boards, it is 17 millimeters. Um, alrighty, uh, axial magnification is transverse magnification squared. So if an object is twice as high, it is four times as wide because two squared is equal to four. What if we don't know what the distance is? to the object? What if we're looking at the object from a telescope? And I'm going to tell you that Saturn is an infinite distance from us. And you're going to say, no, it is not. And I challenge you to tell me what that distance is. And I don't know it either. It's effectively infinite. Rays of light coming from Saturn hit our telescope with a virgence of zero. Now, this is a telescope. And you can tell because it's zero virgence in 
zero virgins out. Uh, the magnification um, that is produced is equal to the eyepiece over the objective. Um, we can see with Saturn here that uh, there is a real image of Saturn that is formed within the tube of the, the telescope where it's formed half a meter to the right. How do I know it's half a meter to the right? Because it's zero virgins coming in. It encounters that plus two lens. Plus two uh, virgins coming out of the lens always and forever means that the rays of light converge one half of a meter to the right. That's within the tube. They then diverge and um, uh, for another 10 centimeters, another tenth of a meter, and strike the eyepiece with a virgins of minus 10, they encounter the eyepiece with a, a, a power of plus 10, and emerge from this telescope again with a virgins of zero. How long is the telescope? It's 60 centimeters, 0.6 meters. The magnification is the um, theta of exit over theta of entrance, but something that's easier to do is just to say that it is the dioptric power of the eyepiece over the objective. This is how I think of astronomical telescopes. Um, I think that we are really in a one lens system with that plus two, and we create this aerial image. And then the plus 10 is kind of our add that lets us get a tenth of a meter from that aerial image to see it. If we wanted the image to subtend twice as much of our visual field, twice the angle of arc of our visual field, then we would have to get even closer to it. Not 10 centimeters, but 5 centimeters. Well, what add would I need for 5 centimeters for 1 20th of a meter? I need a plus 20 add. And that's going to allow me to get uh, twice as close, half the distance, to the um, aerial image. It's going to make it look twice as large in my eye. We're going to be having a plus 20 eyepiece. Plus 20 uh, eyepiece divided by still the plus 2 objective is going to give us a 10 power telescope instead of the original 5 power telescope. Before we move on to different telescopes, let's just take one more look at uh, this one here. So what I want you to see is, is this. The image of Saturn, that, that image that's formed in the middle of the tube, that real image, um, is inverted. Uh, and you can see that from the way that I've drawn uh, these sorts of um, central rays. We're going to compare that now to a Galilean telescope. Uh, in a Galilean telescope, the objective is still plus, but the eyepiece is not plus. The eyepiece in this case is minus. So we saw with the astronomical telescope, it was plus plus. Uh, with the Galilean telescope, it is plus for the objective, but it is minus for the eyepiece. We also notice that the, the length of the tube is shorter here too. So we have zero virgins coming in. You know, all telescopes, zero virgins in, zero virgins out. We have zero virgins coming in, encountering that plus two lens. Uh, the rays of light are going to converge half of a meter to the right, but a tenth of a meter before they make that convergence, while the virgins is still plus 10, we're going to introduce a minus 10 eyepiece. Uh, the uh, calculation of the power, fortunately, is the same, well, with a minus sign. It is eyepiece over objective. But the length of the telescope here is not 60 centimeters, it's 40 centimeters. The uh, other um, characteristic of the Galilean telescope is that the image is observed by the user is not inverted. It is right side up. And I attempt in this diagram to show how that is true. But it is fine for you to take my word for it that a Galilean telescope gives you an upright image. Now, what do we use in, in, in the slit lamp? Because in, in the slit lamp, ev everything's right side up. It turns out we, we don't use a Galilean telescope. We're using an astronomical telescope. But then we're using prisms to re-invert the image. Hooray! Another special topic. We're going to talk about wavefront. And as I mentioned earlier, I have a, a four-part lecture series on topography and wavefront that goes into much more detail than I'm going to go into here. I'm going to breeze through this, but I want you to sort of get a sense of it. Um, in an eye, if we illuminate uh, one little point on the retina, we're going to get rays of light coming out of the eye uh, through the patient's lens, through the pupil. 
uh, and uh, through the, the cornea. Um, if the system were optically perfect and it were a, an emetropic patient, then the wave front, the, 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 this, this front of photons coming out of the eye would be planar. They would all be in the uh, same plane. But eyes are not optically perfect, and that planar wave front um, is uh, going to be bumpy. So p picture it like, like this. Maybe this will be a little bit easier. Imagine having a, a, a tiny area of the retina illuminated with a very brief flash. So we have this cohort of photons that are coming out uh, from the retina. That cohort has a, a contour to it. And if the eye were emetropic, the contour of that cohort of photons would be planar. They would all come out of the eye in one plane. But in an optically imperfect eye, which is to say every eye, uh, the wave front is aberrated and is bumpy. Now, we can quantify things. So this is a, a, a slide that uh, I apologize. It violates all of the norms of the optics lectures in that the rays of light are moving from the right side of the page to the left, uh, but deal with it. Um, so it, the uh, rays of light emerge from the, the, the patient's eye, and they're made to pass through a grid. And it is the uh, spacing of the uh, dots that are produced by the grid that gives us information about the shape of the wavefront um, uh, of, of that, 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 that represents the optics of that patient's eye. Uh, this is a, a, Shartman, a Shack Hartman apparometer, uh, and uh, the grid through which the rays of light pass has little lenslets in it which focus onto a CCD chip and the uh, CCD is looking for the locations of these little dots of uh, light. Apparated wavefront, they will be all askew. So uh, the top image shows a theoretically perfect, well, an actually perfect uh, wavefront. Uh, so if all of the photons come out in a single plane, they hit all the lenslets, they're all focused onto little points on that CCD screen, they will all be equally spaced. However, if the optics of the eye are, are not perfect, then the dots are going to wind up in different places, uh, as is shown in the bottom image. So this is an ideal wavefront, uh, and this is um, the wavefront of eyes that are not uh, optically perfect. So uh, we can see a disrupted tear film on the left, a keratoconus on, on the right. Um, usually with a normal eyes, the, uh, the, the displacement of the dots is not so obviously large. And as with topography, we need computers to uh, plot out uh, what, the, what the wavefront is. And we, we, we get that wavefront as a, a shape, uh, as a, a, a topography, not the topography of the cornea, but the topography of the of the wavefront, and um, the, this uh, this topography we are then going to uh, describe using a three D polynomial, uh, and then we we will use words to describe the shape based on the words we associate uh, with the three D polynomial. So in this case, trefoil, comma, coma, trefoil. Uh, this is my street cred. This is me at the Museum of Zernike Polynomials. The uh, point of light uh, coming out of the uh, eye will not, um, would not resolve uh, to a single point, even if we focus it uh, with a, a spherical lens, because of these aberrations. Uh, and uh, the, the point of light spreads out when you refer to this uh, spreading out as the, the point spread function. And uh, what you see here is the, the distortion, the, the, the point spread function, uh, as a function of pupil size. And the larger the pupil, um, the, the bigger the role the um, aberrations play in, in the, the point spread function. 
Um, I am going to, as I said, blow through this uh, just to sort of give you a, a sense. We refer to these as different orders of uh, polynomial, of Zernike polynomial. Uh, and again, I, I go through this much more uh, in the wavefront and, and topography lecture. Uh, third order Zernike polynomials are where we start getting interested uh, in clinically. Uh, these are uh, a, a stigmatism and defocus, defocus meaning myopia or hyperopia. Um, and then uh, uh, fourth order uh, polynomials, oh, excuse me, other third order polynomials uh, include things like trefoil and coma. Coma is something that, that we that we do talk about uh, in um, in in optics, uh, not in these series of lectures. Trefoil much less so, and then there are of course uh, fancier names until uh, we we've decided to sort of give up on naming things and just say oh they're all just just pretty shapes. So this is uh, the, 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 the impact that uh, Wavefront has uh, can, can be substantial on the, on, the, on the quality of patient's vision. Why do we care? Well, uh, some ophthalmologists do Wavefront measurements on patients in advance of determining whether they're a candidate or to determine whether they're candidates for multifocal lenses. If they're getting a lot of uh, Wavefront aberration, uh, then maybe it's best not to aberrate things further with a... Um, with with a with a multifocal lens, uh, we can correct for wavefront uh, in uh, telescopes uh, and maybe one day in in spectacles. Um, the telescope images a star. The star is passing. The light of the star is passing through empty space, but then it's passing through our turbulent atmosphere, uh, and um, we can compensate. Uh, and in, in this turbulence, it's coming into areas of different air density, which have indices that are different, and it will, will, will distort uh, the uh, wavefront. Um, we uh, can compensate for this um, by uh, rapidly adjusting the uh, mirror, and um, these are adaptive optics uh, telescopes, um, but uh, th this is where we're really getting off topic here. Let's talk about simple magnifiers, and simple magnifiers are kind of anything but. If all that we're interested in is um, what we have to know for the boards, or OCAPs, uh, simple magnifiers, you figure out the magnification as diopters over 4, D over 4. So if this is a plus 20 lens, uh, then D over 4 is uh, equal to 5, so it's a 5 times simple magnifier. Uh, end of story. Uh, okay, so let's see what simple magnifiers actually do and sort of what the, the, the magic things are that, that, that we've got to know from this. So uh, this is a, a simple lens problem. We're 25 centimeters. Um, the uh, candle on the left, 25 centimeters from the lens, uh, plus 10 lens, so 10 over 4 is 2.5. It should be a 2.5 power lens. Should make things 2.5 times larger, right? Well, let, let, let's see what it does. So 25 centimeters uh, means that the rays of light hit the lens with a vergence of minus 4. Uh, they encounter the plus 10 lens. They exit the lens with a vergence of plus 6. Plus 6 means that the rays of light converge a sixth of a meter to the right. Well, six of a meter is less than a fourth of a meter. So, in fact, the image in this system is minified, not magnified, and certainly not 2.5 times greater. So, I am going to show you how I think of these systems, and I think it's a good way to think of them. Uh, so, this is a plus 10 lens, and I'm going to give us a, a little landmark. Uh, with the focal point here is... Um, one tenth of a meter, 0.1 meters to the left. I'm going to put that out as a landmark. I'm also going to put out as a landmark two times the focal point, which in this case is 0.2 meters uh, to the left of the lens. And I'm going to show you why it's relevant. Let's look at an ant. And this ant is somewhere between the lens and F. In this case, <coughs> it's 0 0.08 meters. That means that the vergence of the rays of light emanating from it are going to hit the lens with a vergence of minus 12.5 and are going to exit the lens with a vergence of minus 2.5.
which means that the image is going to be, minus means it's going to be to the left, and 2.5 means that it's going to be 0.4 meters to the left. So the image is going to be formed to the left where I put I. We're going to draw out our central rays uh, from the head of the ant uh, through the lens and from the thorax of the ant through the lens, and we're going to extrapolate them both backwards to I. And we see that, in this case, we really are getting magnification. So tell me about this, this, this image. What are its, its characteristics? Well, it's magnified, it's upright, and it's virtual because it's off sides. Okay? So if the object is between the lens and F, the image will be upright, magnified, and virtual. What if the object is between f and 2f? What's going to happen then? So in this case, we're 1 8th of a meter, 0.125 meters. Rays of light are going to strike the lens with a virgins of minus 8. Emerge from the lens with a virgins of plus 2. Plus 2 means forever and always, half of a meter to the right. So the image is going to be 0.5 meters to the right. We'll draw our central rays out and then look at our image and what is it? Well, it's magnified, certainly, because 0.5 is greater than 0.125. It's magnified. It's real because it's to the right of the lens, and it is inverted. So for objects between f and 2f, the image will be magnified, inverted, and real. What if the object is beyond 2f, in this case half a meter? This time we're striking the lens of virgins of minus 2, exiting with a virgins of plus 8. The image is going to be formed an eighth of a meter. Draw our central rays. And our image is going to be what, what, and what? It's going to be real, inverted, and minified. So between F and the lens, it's magnified, virtual, and upright. Between F and 2F, it's magnified, real, and inverted. And beyond 2F, it is minified, real, and inverted. What about the case of a minus 10 lens? With minus, it's easy. Minus is always going to give you an image that is upright, uh, excuse me, is upright, virtual, and minified. Always, always, always. So let's try to work some problems from this. So this is... A, a former leopard gecko of mine, uh, now in leopard gecko heaven, um, and uh, we are putting it under a, a simple magnifier, under a plus lens, and let's see if we can solve uh, this problem. So a 10 centimeter leopard gecko reclines in front of a plus 20 lens. How large does the gecko appear? Well, we're not given any distances here. Uh, so this is simply a, a simple magnifier problem. So d over 4, uh, the dioptric power here is 20. So uh, 20 over, uh, well, here, let, 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 let me give you the, 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 the choices. Can we figure it out? Is it 40 centimeters? Is it 50 centimeters? Or is it 2.5 centimeters? Well, we can figure it out. As I said, it's a simple magnifier problem. Uh, and as a simple magnifier, it's going to be magnified because it's a plus lens. D over 4 is uh, equal to 5. Uh, so it's going to be 5 times greater. 5 times 10 centimeters is 50 centimeters. So the correct answer is C, 50 centimeters. Okay, let's do a completely different and unrelated problem. This time we have our 10 centimeter leopard gecko in front of a 20 diopter lens, but it's 25 centimeters. It's a quarter diopter in front of the uh, lens. Um, what is its size going to, to be? Well, what is the, um, what is, where is F for a 20 diopter lens? F is at five centimeters, right? Where's 2F? It's at 10 centimeters. So we're beyond 2F. If we're beyond 2F from the uh, plus lens, our image is always going to be what, what, and what? It's going to be real, inverted, 
and minified. So the answer here must be D. It must be 2.5 centimeters. Don't believe me? All right. So 25 uh, centimeters, 0.25 meters, minus 4 going in, plus 20 coming out, uh, which means that it is plus 16 coming out of the lens. A sixteenth of a meter is that number there. And our gecko will be inverted, real, and minified. Remember this stuff? The ants. Just flipping through it just to, to, to remind you. Um, so if we're between F and the lens, it is uh, virtual, um, upright, and um, magnified. Between F and 2F, it is real, inverted, and magnified. And if we are beyond 2F, then it is going to be real, inverted, and minified. And again, minus lenses, we don't have to worry about anything. So our gecko was beyond 2F. That's how we knew. OK, so um, here is uh, a, a uh, oh, here is the problem that we just did. Good for us. Here is a completely different problem. Um, it, it, it's simply to ask, is the image inverted uh, and real? Um, and we know that we are beyond 2F, so it is real, and it is inverted, uh, and it's also minified. We know that from the, the, the previous problem. So this is B. Let's, let's make this problem minimalistic. There exists a lens, an object, and an image. That is all that exists. The image is upright. So is the image real? Is it virtual? Or can we not know? Well, we, we can know because in order to be inverted, if there's only one object and only one lens, uh, in order to be inverted, it must be on the opposite side of the lens from the object. And that means that it's real. So if it is inverted, um, if it is inverted and it is magnified, and it's a plus five diopter lens, then where is the object with respect to the lens. So remember, we've got three situations. One of them is virtual, magnified, and upright. One of them is inverted, real, and magnified. And the other one is inverted, real, and minified. So if this one is inverted, magnified, we know by virtue of the fact that it's inverted that it's got to be real, where must the object be? It must be between F and 2F. So it must be B, between 20 centimeters and 40 centimeters from the lens. Last one. There is a lens, an object, and an image. The object is 10 centimeters from the lens, so it's 0.1 meters from the lens. The image is upright and minified. Which of the following is plausible? So it's upright and minified. I'll let you look at the answers. I'm not going to, I mean, the choices. I'm not going to read them to you. The answer has to be D. Because in order to get something that is minified and upright, uh, it um, first of all, if it's upright, it's on the same side of the lens as the as the. Um, object and to be minified it has to be closer to the lens, so there has to be a minus lens. So it has to be D, and of course, minus lenses always make things virtual, 
upright, and minified. A special topic, multifocal lenses. Now, I have an entire lecture on multifocal lenses uh, that as of the recording of this lecture, I have not recorded. Uh, I, I only give it live, but perhaps I, I will record it one day. Um, so I am not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about uh, multifocals either. Um, but this is a, uh, a, a multifocal uh, one-piece lens, and uh, this is a different uh, multifocal one-piece lens. Um, and uh, what I want to show you is uh, this. This is an, an airy disk. An airy disk is a special point spread function uh, that um, in, in, in which we have high amplitude right in the center and then some concentric rings of nodes and antinodes. There is a lot of energy here that is not being uh, concentrated in that center. Uh, ideally, in a point spread function, you want a point, uh, but there's energy that's being wasted on these rings. Um, the, um, the design of uh, some multifocal lenses um, includes apodization. And apodization means the removal or the, the minimization of these, uh, these rings of the airy disk in order to concentrate most of the optical energy right in the uh, center. Uh, and there are trifocal lenses, and uh, there's a trifocal lens in the uh, US too. Not this one, though. OK, a brief word about dysphotopsias. Um, as third years, uh, you, you are going to, uh, yes, dysphotopsias. As uh, third years, uh, you will encounter some patients uh, with dysphotopsias um, after cataract surgery. And it may be that they describe seeing an arc of brightness uh, that is in their peripheral vision when there's a bright light off to the side. Or it, they may be describing an area of darkness. Um, so rays of light come into the lens and focus on the retina, and that is a beautiful thing. However, uh, rays of light, light, light uh, can also come in obliquely, and in doing so, they can bounce around inside of the implant, uh, focus in the vitreous because they're passing through uh, the, the, this, this curvature twice, and uh, be imaged fuzzily on the retina in a different location um, from where the main image is. And this is a positive dysphotopsia, where the implant lens acts almost like a little fiber optic. It is unclear um, f from where uh, negative dysphotopsia is the areas of darkness arise, um, it, it is felt to have something to do with the square edge of the lens. Uh, the implant lenses have square edges to minimize PCO, um, uh, but uh, it, it seems that, that the price that we pay for that square edge is that some patients will get negative dysphotopsias. Okay, let's move on to uh, mirrors. Uh, which is our last big topic. Um, and uh, we, we are used to uh, lens systems in which the object is to the left of the lens, the lens is in the middle, and the image is to the right of the lens. With mirrors, the rays of light, I know this is going to come as a shock, hit the mirror and bounce back. Well, our conventions do the same. As long as the rays of light have not hit the mirror yet, uh, as long as they're coming out of the object, if the object's to the left, then the object's real. After the rays of light hit the mirror, our conventions are mirrored. And if the image is to the left of the lens, the image is real. If the image is to the right of the lens, it's offsides. One of the classic mirror problems is how tall does a full-length mirror have to be in order for someone to see his entire body? And so we're going to work through this sort of geometrically. 
Uh, here we have um, a, a person and his twin, and they are equidistant from and on opposite sides of a window. So the question is, how long does this window have to be? Um, if we pretend that this person is not a human but a crab and has got eyes on the very top of his head, uh, then the top of the window has to be aligned with the top of his head. And the bottom of the window has to be aligned with half his height. And you can see this geometrically because uh, the base of the first triangle is half the base of the second triangle. Well, if we replace this uh, window with a mirror, then we see that uh, a mirror need only be half the height of the uh, person using it in order to see his entire full length. Now, um, what, um, what, var what variable is not included in, in this? Well, what's not included is his distance uh, to the mirror. As long as this is a plano mirror, the, his distance from it doesn't matter. He will always see exactly his height, uh, no more, uh, and no less, uh, even if he gets closer to the mirror, um, it's not going to uh, give him a wider view of himself. So try this yourself with a hand mirror. Uh, so hold the hand mirror some relatively close distance uh, to yourself and see uh, the extent of you that you can see. And then push the mirror uh, as far out as you can hold it and um, recognize that you can see exactly as much of yourself, uh, not any more and not any less. Anyway, a cool thing. So um, in, in addition to conventions about real and virtual being inverted, uh, being mirrored once the light hits a, a mirror, so are the concave and convex stuff. So a convex lens is a plus lens. A convex mirror is a minus mirror. Um, so let's look at the primary focal point. That's the focal point from which rays of light emanating and striking the, in this case, mirror, will emerge with a zero virgins. Uh, and, and you can see where that is. And the secondary focal point is when zero virgins rays of light encounter the mirror, where those rays of light come into focus, uh, where, where they converge. And with mirrors, conveniently, the secondary and the primary focal points are in the same place. So with mirrors, we just talk about a focal point. Uh, concave mirrors, uh, conversely, are uh, plus mirrors. Uh, and uh, their focal point is to the left of the mirror. We saw with convex ones uh, that it was to the right of the mirror. OK, so let's kind of think things through. If I am standing in the middle of a, a mirrored sphere, as I want to do, and I look in any direction at that sphere, everything will uh, intersect uh, with a right angle. So um, that means that if I'm at R, uh, all of the light will bounce back to me, to R. You know from your um, lens uh, Im image object problems that if you move an object uh, further from the lens, that the image will move closer to the lens. So it's the same thing with a, um, a mirror. And if we extend the object all the way out to infinity, the rays of light will converge at R over 2. So that is how we calculate where the focal point is. The focal point is 1 over f, or r over 2. And the doctric power, then, is 2 over r. OK. Uh, so the uh, cornea as a uh, convex mirror is a um, almost a trope in, uh, in OCAPs. Um, and since they want you to be able to calculate things in your head, uh, they'll commonly give you a radius of curvature of the cornea of 8 millimeters, which is actually a little bit flat for a real cornea. Uh, 8 millimeters, and ask you what the uh, dietric power is. Uh, 8 millimeters, um, uh, 2 over r, r in uh, meters, uh, gives you a reflecting power of uh, 250 diopters. Now, is it 250, is, is that plus or minus? Well, we know that the corneax is a plus lens overall. Um, but it is convex, and therefore it is a minus mirror. Uh, and minus, um, harking back to our simple uh, ma magnifier stuff, means what? It means that your image will always be upright, uh, minified, and virtual. Now, what does virtual mean 
for a, a mirror. Virtual means that it is on the right side of the mirror. Remember, once the rays of light hit the mirror, the conventions, including real and virtual, are themselves mirrored. Um, so uh, where do the rays of light converge? Well, they converge uh, at R over 2, which would be 4 millimeters. So um, the rays of light converge about at the iris plane. The iris, you know, the third years who have measured ACD know that the ACD is, it's less than four millimeters, but it's not far from it. Um, and you can experience this also with a slit lamp because the, uh, the reflections from the slit lamp, from the little filament in the slit lamp bulb, if you have a, a filamentary slit lamp and not an LED slit lamp, um, those are most annoying, not when you're focused at the cornea plane, but when you're focused at the iris plane, uh, because those uh, f that, that the filament will actually image uh, when you're in focus uh, on that plane. Anyway, try it yourself. Okay, a special topic, uh, and this special topic is illuminatin. Um, it is uh, it is illumination from uh, the the slit lamp, and um, it is uh, uh, relevant primarily in. Um, photography, but you know, it's it's my my recollection is is that it's actually in the optics book, and so it's potentially something that that you've that you've got to know. Uh, this is bringing the uh, slit beam directly uh, in, and conveniently, this is called direct illumination. These are the snail trails of a posterior uh, polymorphous, and um, they are on the endothelium. And I'm not observing them uh, directly with the beam. That's actually really hard to do. But what I'm doing is I'm bouncing the beam off of the iris. And this is called specular reflection. And it's helpful for looking at things in the endothelium. What if I want to look at the lens? Here I'm seeing lens vacuoles and all sorts of lens stuff. Uh, this, uh, I'm bouncing the light off of the retina, and we call this retro illumination. And then this is the one that you guys probably don't know, uh, but is worth learning even uh, just for your, your regular slit lamp um, exam. This is to highlight elements in the corneal stroma. And what you do is you bring the beam in uh, very uh, bright, uh, a very, very, very oblique angle. And you're trying to use the cornea like a fiber optic to bounce the light around inside of the cornea. And that is called sclerotic scatter. So you're sort of aiming for the, for the limbus there. Ooh, I put the slides in in, in in the wrong place. These are all of the things that I just told you, but we went over them, we did them in our heads. We don't need these silly slides. Okay, uh, IOL calculation after refractive surgery. Again, this is something that is, um, I, I believe, is in one of the lectures I've recorded. I think it's in the, the topography and wavefront lecture. So I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time uh, with it here. This is the SRK formula, SRK1 formula. Um, and the uh, issue for us is uh, keratometry. Keratometry is where uh, we get fooled with um, with our calculations after keratorefractive surgery, particularly after PRK and LASIK. So um, this is a, a topography of a cornea, and this is showing us the three millimeter annulus, uh, which is the average uh, size that a keratometer measures, and it gives you the um, curvatures at these uh, points, uh, or, or at, at four of these points, um, and they're they're fairly representative of the central corneal curvature for a surgically naive cornea. This being a surgically naive cornea, a little bit steeper centrally than it is in the, the periphery, but not tremendously steeper centrally than it is one and a half millimeters from the center or at the three millimeter annulus. Now, this is someone who's had uh, PRK. Um, the 
annulus, this, the area, well, the, the, the circle that is measured by the keratometer, um, is a function also of uh, corneal curvature. If the cornea is very steep, then that annulus is going to be smaller than 3 millimeters. If it's flat, as in after keratorefractive surgery, the annulus is, is actually going to be larger. And you see that the annulus here is not representative of the central cornea. And we are going to get a reading for keratometry that is steeper than... Um, uh, then the, the central cornea is. We're going to overestimate the power of the cornea. Uh, we're going to um, have an intraocular lens power that is too low, and we're going to make the patient hyperopic. Uh, this is uh, M.C. Escher uh, in a drawing of his, and you see uh, all of uh, Escher and his library uh, over, I don't know, what would you say, maybe 15 centimeters uh, um, diameter on the on the left, and if the ball were smaller, then we see the same scene, but over maybe only seven millimeters. Um, this is um, an an illustration <clears throat> uh, that I alluded to in I think Act Three when we talked about the spacing of rings uh, in 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 topographies. also is an illustration of the annulus. I guess that that's why I showed those slides, uh, that the annulus would be larger if the cornea is flatter. When we talked about topography, we also talked about the hole in the, in the middle. Um, this is uh, a um, video cartographer or corneal topographer, and as you can see, there's a camera in the middle so right in the middle of uh, the cornea, right in that visual axis, we're actually not getting any readings. Uh, there's a hole there. The, um, the last problem is, is this. So do you, do you guys know what keratometers actually measure and what topographers measure? They, they, they don't actually measure the dielectric power. What they measure is the radius of curvature of the uh, anterior curvature of the cornea. We then convert these uh, radii to dielectric powers. You, you can actually see this on the keratometer. If you look at the dials on, on the side, um, it's, it, they're, they're typically calibrated both in uh, radii and in diopters. It's not that it's radii for purists. We need radii when we're doing things like hard contact lens fitting. Um, but uh, so that that conversion is predicated on um, a relationship between the anterior and posterior corneal curvatures. And we know that the posterior corneal curvature is, of course, more steep than the anterior one is. Uh, so if you were to excise a, a cornea in air and hold it up in air, first of all, that would be a terrible thing to do. Uh, but it would also be a, a minus lens because it's thinner in the middle and uh, thicker towards the uh, edge. Uh, and that contribution of the, the, the posterior cornea is factored in to um, the uh, conversion from um, radii to, to dielectric power. Uh, and the, the end that, that we use for that conversion is 1.337. So that, that's a, a fudged no number. The uh, stroma has a lot of different indices. But I know a, a, a sort of a gross average would be 1.375. So if it's 1.375, why is it that we use 1.337? And that's because it's a sort of a, a fudged value that accounts uh, for the contribution of the, the posterior cornea. And again, it's predicated on uh, a fixed relationship between the anterior and posterior cur curvatures uh, of the cornea. Well, that relationship is violated uh, when we do... Um, keratoablative surgery like LASIK or uh, PRK. Now, the uh, posterior cornea is a lot steeper than the anterior cornea is, and the fudged index of 1.337 does not hold. The true power of the uh, cornea, then, is um, it, it, it can be corrected uh, with um, uh, the ablated 
uh, index over the uh, fudged index, but what that difference is. And it turns out um, that the, uh, the, the 1.375, as I said, over 1.337, is, is that the uh, calculations will be off by 11%. Now, not 11% of the, um, of the total power of the, the cornea, but 11% of the power correction. So if the uh, correction done to a patient, let's say that the patient uh, was minus 9 and now is Plano, um, the keratometry, even if we were able to measure the actual central keratometry and not deal with this annulus, uh, we would overestimate the cornea power, overestimate the cornea power by 11% of that 9-diopter treatment or 1-diopter. And we're going to, again, estimate the cornea to have more power, more converging power than it does. And we're going to make the patient hyperopic. So we've seen two sources of error so far. <coughs> Excuse me. Two sources of error so far with uh, dioptric power of the cornea. One is the fact that we're not measuring central cornea. And therefore, we're going to judge the cornea to be of higher power than it is. The second being that the index of refraction that we're using for the cornea is off, and we're going to judge the cornea to be of higher power than it is. Both of these things are going to tend towards hyperopia. They're both additive. There's one more source of error uh, with the patient, and it is an ELP error, an effective lens position error. So um, we have two eyes here uh, on the right is an eye that is emetropic, and on the left is a myopic patient with a laser flattened cornea. And you can just sort of make that out in the diagram. But what I want you to see is that the ACD on the left is a lot deeper. The, the anterior chamber depth on the left is a lot deeper than the anterior chamber depth on the right. And that's because, of course, myopes uh, have got long eyes and deeper chambers. And that means that when you put the intraocular lens in the eye, it is going to sit more posteriorly in, um, in a post-myopic keratorefractive eye, then the formulas are going to predict that it would because the formulas are based on uh, surgically naive eyes and uh, the estimated lens position is going to be off. So what does this mean for, for us? If we put the lens more posterior, if we wanted to achieve the same lens power, would we have to increase the power of the IOL or decrease the power of the IOL? Now, we haven't talked about uh, virgin's corrections for, for, for contact lenses yet. That's going to be one of our last topics. But you guys know sort of what, what it is. Uh, it's that as you move from the spectacle plane to the corneal plane, that you have to add plus power to the contact lens in order to achieve the same refractive result. Well, the same thing's true of the IOL. If we're moving the IOL more posteriorly, we need to add plus power to the IOL to achieve the same refractive result. So if the lens is sitting more posteriorly, we're going to overestimate the converging power of the intraocular lens. And that's going to make the patient, guess what, hyperopic. So there are three errors that can occur uh, that are intrinsic to lens calculations in um, patients who've had ablative um, myopic uh, keratorefractive surgery. And they're all going to tend towards making the patient hyperopic. A special topic again, light tissue interaction. Um, and, and this is my uh, clinical slide on the right. Um, actually, this is my clinical slide. So uh, photocoagulation is a laser tissue interaction in which heat is transferred uh, to the tissue that denatures proteins. And this is, of course, PRP. There is photoablation. Uh, in which there's really no heat transfer, very, very little heat transfer. And uh, what it is is that, that, that the binding um, energy of uh, the, the, the collagen polymer is almost exactly equal to uh, the 6.3 electron volt energy of a 193 nanometer photon, which is the photon, of course, that the Exmor laser puts out. So that this, this energy is just exchanged. The uh, tissue absorbs the uh, photon and the bond is broken, and there's not a lot of leftover energy uh, for heat. So that is called photo 
ablation. Of course, there's a very famous photograph of a human hair that has been crenellated. Look at that word, crenellation. That has been crenellated um, by an Exmor laser. Photodisruption is uh, using the laser to produce a shock wave and using the shock wave to tear things. And this is the way uh, that YAG uh, capsulotomy works. And then photoactivation is um, laser absorption that causes a chemical change. So uh, what is uh, an example of photoactivation? Well, you know, visudine, uh, uh, vertiporphyrin, it, um, is uh, photoactivated. It's uh, not commonly uh, used now, uh, but it was uh, what we had before we had anti-VEGF therapy. But you guys, of course, know uh, an example of photoactivation uh, that is far more ubiquitous than vertiporphyrin, in which absorption of a photon causes a conformational change, a configuration change, in a protein, and that is, of course, rhodopsin. That's how we see. I thought that we would do some multi-lens exercises now, uh, because all of the stuff of which we have spoken uh, have been single-lens problems. So this is a multi-lens problem, um, and the way that I want you to think of multi-lens problems is as multiple single-lens problems. So in our little uh, simian brains, uh, we can contain one object, one lens, and one image. And we ignore absolutely everything that does not have a subscript of one. So object one, lens one, image one. If, we want, if we're given that image one is where it is relative to the lens, and we want to know if it is inverted or upright, uh, we're going to do central ray tracing. Uh, so we already have one central ray here. That's the ray that carries information about the base of the uh, candle. We're now going to do our central ray about the apex of the candle through uh, lens number one. And we ignore lens number two. It is if it is not there. Uh, is um, image number one real or virtual? It's real. Of course it's real. It's to the right of the lens. The lens, not a lens. We only store in our brain one lens. Now, uh, image number one is object number two. That's the way that it works. And uh, we're going to ask, is image number two inverted or upright? We again do central ray tracing. And we discover that it is upright. Now, uh, let's say that uh, we do some calculations with vergence. And uh, we need to figure out uh, what the uh, vergence is here. Um, so let's uh, draw some vergence lines. So minus two going in plus three going out is a third of a, of a meter. So it's going to be an additional third of a meter this way. Um, so the rays of light that are encountering, uh, the, now, that, now we're all in subscript two, encountering the lens, meaning lens number two, which is that which for which we are trying to solve, uh, is uh, going to be uh, minus three because the rays of light converge one third of a meter to the left. And we know that they converge one third of a meter to the right. So the question is, what is the contribution of the lens? And it is going to be, of course, plus six. What about this problem? Um, so uh, we are dealing, of course, not with the multi-lens problem, but with two single lens problems that are superimposed. Let's do some calculating. So one half meter to the left means that the vergence is what? One half meter to the left always means the same thing, minus two. Minus two plus one is equal to minus one. And minus one means that the rays of light converge where? They converge. We extrapolate this backwards. They converge one meter to the left. I know the little slide there is sort of cut off, but you, you get the gist of it. So what is there? What is uh, at that point that is one meter to the left? Well, that's image number one. Um, now, uh, let us, uh, so, but of course, the 
uh, rays of light aren't really going backwards. This is not a mirror. That's why we draw them as, as dotted. Uh, we know that really they're, they're extending forward and all that we've done is extrapolate them backwards. Now we are in subscript two land. Um, first of all, uh, object number one, real or virtual? It's real. Um, image number one, uh, real or virtual? It's virtual because it's to the left of the lens. It's off sides. Object number two, now we're only dealing with subscript number two, including lens number two. Object number two, real or virtual? It's real. It's to the left of the lens. Does it bother you that image number one is virtual, but object number two is real? No, it doesn't bother you. All right, now we have erased from our minds everything that had a subscript of one. Now the only things in our minds are those things that have a subscript of two. And uh, we uh, know now that we are two meters from this lens, uh, which means that the rays of light must intersect the lens with a vergence of uh, minus 0.5. Uh, we converge one meter to the right, must have a vergence of plus one. Therefore, uh, the uh, power of the lens has to be um, plus 1.5. And if we are doing this for central ray tracing, then we see that image number one is going to be upright, uh, magnified, and virtual. What is its uh, height going to be? It's going to be twice the height of object number one. Um, so um, image number one is twice as high, meaning the transverse mag is two. If the transverse mag is two, what's the axial mag? Axial mag has to be four. Okay, now that we have this, we're going to do our central ray tracing uh, through lens number two. We only see things that have a subscript of two and uh, therefore we see that this is inverted. And uh, if you do the calculations, you're going to in fact find out that uh, image number two is the same height as object number one was. It's gonna be half the height of image number one or object number two. Let's talk about uh, rigid contact lens fitting. Um, as with everything else, that has been invented. It was thought of by Leonardo da Vinci first. Uh, his idea of uh, for a rigid contact lens uh, would be uh, a, an entire bowl of water uh, in which the uh, patient would submerge his face. And uh, with that, he would be able to see clearly uh, uh, just, just before he drowned. Um, okay, so um, this is uh, OCAP's hard contact lens fitting. Uh, do not do this on a real actual patient. Uh, so we are going to, first of all, uh, talk about the um, curvatures of the rigid contact lens in terms of dioptric power, in terms of keratometry. Now, in the real world, you're going to be ordering them. Well, in the real world, most of you are probably not going to be ordering them, period. But if you do, you need to order a radius of curvature in millimeters, and we've, we've discussed that uh, quite thoroughly now. But for the purpose of, the, of this conversation, let's discuss things in terms of keratometry. So we find the flattest keratometry of the cornea, the flat meridian, and I'm going to add a vault to it because I want the back surface of the contact lens to not conform exactly with the cornea, but to have this little sort of a vault. I'm going to have it a little bit steeper. How much steeper? 0.5 diopters steeper. Then I'm going to make sure I'm working in minus cylinder. I know in this program we work in minus cylinder. Do you know, it, it turns out it's an East Coast, West Coast thing, kind of like wrap, you know, whether we use minus cylinder, we use plus cylinder. You have no idea what they're going to give you with the, with the OCAP. So be prepared to convert to uh, minus cylinder. And then after having done so, we drop the uh, cylinder because that is um, uh, completely compensated for by the tear lens. Okay, so we disregard cylinder. Then we do a vertex correction. And you remember how to do this. We did this before, right? A minus five at the spectacle plane, 20 centimeters to the uh, far point. 
um, which means that it is 21.2 centimeters uh, from the cornea and uh, therefore the virgins at the cornea is going to be minus 4.72. So uh, minus 4.72 is what the power that we need at the cornea plane. And then there's one last thing that we have to do. So this, this tier vault that we put in is um, it, it, it itself has some optical power. Uh, it is uh, thicker in the middle and it is thinner at the edges. So it itself is a plus lens. It's contributing some plus power. How much? Well, it's the difference in, in the case, approximately, um, between the uh, back of the contact lens and the front of the patient's cornea. Uh, so uh, it's half a diopter. Why? Because that's what we chose. We could have chosen a vault of 0.75 or 0.25, but we chose 0.5, and therefore we need to subtract 0.5 uh, from our uh, final um, calculation, which unfortunately I I don't show here. So you know it was minus four uh, 4.72, uh, so uh, which would round to 4.75. So in fact, what we're going to prescribe is minus 5.25 by subtracting the extra. Uh, 0.5 diopters to, co to compensate for the uh, tear lens. Okay, so this is something that I just want to sort of run through once, which is a vertex correction for cylinder. This is not something that we encounter in ophthalmology um, very much now. Um, and and that, that's well, it, it, we, 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 this doesn't happen very often, uh, but I want to show you how to, how to do it. And back in the day uh, when we were using uh, summit eczema lasers for uh, PRK treatments, the summit would not do vertex correction for you. So if you wanted to treat sphere cylinder, you actually had to do a calculation like this. So uh, this is a lens that is minus 6 plus 5 axis 90 at the spectacle plane. We make a total power cross, uh, as we've done um, many times before. Uh, and then we do a vertex correction for each arm of the total power cross separately. Now, you know that you don't have to do vertex corrections for dioptric powers less than four, absolute values less than four. So we're not going to fiddle with the uh, horizontal um, meridian that is uh, minus 1.0. We're only going to do the correction for the vertical one. Uh, correcting minus 6 gives us minus 5.6. Um, remember, as we go from the spectacle plane to the cornea plane, we're adding plus, so that's our sort of check that we've done this right. Yes, we have. We've gone from 6 to minus 5.6. We're going to round that to minus 5.5 because there aren't lenses that are 5.6. And then we have a, a total power cross that is 5.5 vertically, uh, minus 1 horizontally, and um, that means uh, that the... Um, that when we calculate our powers, that not only will the sphere have changed, but the cylinder will have changed too. So it used to be minus 6 plus 5 axis 90. It's going to wind up being minus 550 plus 450, because we are still sticking with that minus 1, axis 90. Again, you know, this is becoming more esoteric as, as time goes on. This, I think, is our last topic. So it is optical instruments and how they work. So you guys, I know you guys know how to check IOP. But do you know why it is the way that it is? So there are um, two things that keep you from truly checking the intraocular pressure. One of those things is the rigidity of the cornea. Right? Even if the IOP were zero, you wouldn't get a zero reading because the cornea itself is pressing out. Uh, and that is going to give you a falsely high eye pressure, right? Because there's some contribution of the cornea. The other one is the, the capillary action of the tear film on the tenometer tip, which is sucking the tip towards the eye. And uh, that's going to give you a, a falsely low reading for intraocular power. So what we'd love is we'd love these two forces to cancel out, and indeed they do. If we applinate the cornea to an applination diameter of 3.06 millimeters. At this point, the tear film surface tension and the rigidity of the cornea cancel each other out. 
how do we measure 3.06 millimeters? We measure it by using a prism um, on our applinator tip, as our applinator tip. And uh, that is why the prism, um, that, that, that we use that prism and that we use uh, these rings to, to calculate things, and why it's going to be the inner ring, because that prism is offset by exactly 3.06 millimeters. So not, not a lot of people use PAMs anymore, but potential acuity meters are used to project uh, an image around areas that are more lucent in a uh, cataract to see what the patient's capable of uh, seeing. Uh, another technology is a laser interferometer that casts bands on the patient's retina that can give some indication of uh, what the uh, resolution of the uh, macula is, the perceived resolution. Um, I am not going to discuss this. I'm just going to leave this up here for a, a couple seconds as a reference. Uh, I have never uh, seen um, on the OCAPS uh, anybody ask you how confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopes work. However, uh, Scheinflug cameras are worth talking about. So there are a couple of commercial uh, Scheinflug cameras. One of them is the, the Pentacam, uh, which I think we, we're either getting or, or have gotten in um, uh, our clinic. And the, the, the Pentacam works, um, it, Scheinflug works um, by employing uh, a, 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 a tilt shift lens. So this is an example of a tilt shift photo, and they all look great. They look like they're little tiny toys, but of course this is a real uh, photograph of um, uh, stuff going on beneath the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and what you want to notice is that there is, uh, because of the tilt of the lens, there's one plane that is in focus, and anything that is in front or in back of, of that plane is very, very much blurred. So a Pentacam uses uh, the same um, isolation of a frame to do almost an optical tomography of the uh, cornea um, to to produce uh, a, 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 a number of cross sections through the cornea that can be uh, reassembled into uh, a topography of the front and back surface of the uh, cornea. And I think I have an illustration here. Yes, here is an illustration of the Pentacam hard at work. Of course, it's in German. Right, so the Pentacam has to rotate in order to get all of those cross sections uh, that it will then computationally assemble. So you see, in uh, this case, it's not the lens that's tilted. It's the, the, the CCD, the uh, camera chip, that is tilted. But effectively, it's doing the uh, same, same thing. It's making its own little tilt shift camera. Uh, and uh, it is able to assemble uh, things uh, for us. I am not going to describe the inner workings of an OCT because I am in the same program as Joel Schumann um, who woke up one day and said, let there be OCT, and there was OCT, and we all saw that it was good. Anyway, there's an awful lot that uh, we've covered uh, in uh, this crash course, and uh, I am sure that you guys have questions. If you don't have questions, it's because you didn't understand it. Uh, and uh, I am uh, very easy to reach and would uh, far prefer to handle these these questions on a one on one or small group basis uh, rather than everybody because different people uh, internalize this information um, differently. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I hope you had uh, as good a time as I did and um, I will uh, look forward to speaking with all of you.